recommend that you actually uninstall Node and uh, uninstall Brew. What was the second one? Uninstall Brew. Do you have Brew installed? If you don't have Brew installed, then you don't need to uninstall it. But you will need to install it at some point, and so I will show you how you can install it correctly. Because the instructions on the website, of course, tell you how to install it incorrectly. Uh, there are instructions on how to install it correctly, but they're buried. And so you'd have to know. Okay, so I think... All right, here we go. Does anybody want to check? Or maybe I can check. Let's check and see if we're actually live on the YouTubes right now. We should be. We should be live on the YouTubes and live on the Twitches. And the audio should be coming through. Let's see, we got... Good, looks like the audio is working. Cool, so we'll just hang out for a few minutes. And, uh, oh, oh, it's because it's that one. Right, 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 right. All right. Hey, we're merging more. Do you want the beta? Yeah, well, thank you. Good. Hello. Hi. What's your name? Cece. Okay. Kyle. Are we live? All right, we're live right now. Content. Uh, oh no! Oh no! Don't 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 go away. You never know. All right. I'm gonna grab some pizza. Feel free to do introductions. If you want to say hello to the camera, you can. Supposedly, our friends will be joining us. Um, I guess I should open. Does somebody want to open up Jitsi? Would somebody open up Jitsi and just see if anybody's there and then direct them to my, I don't know. But I'm going to grab some pizza real quick and we'll get started in about five to ten minutes. Come in, come in. Oh, good crowd, too. How's it going? Good. Yep, these are good. What's your name? Uh, my name is Ray. Okay, Kyle. Nice to meet you, Ray. Nice to meet you, Harvey. Nice to meet you, Harvey. Kyle. Hello, Michael. Ray, nice to meet you. Yes. So Jake, with this problem, I've been working for like <laughs> close to an hour to figure this out. Oh, no. All these different resources, none of them recommended NPX. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So NPX, if you didn't know, it'll run that script. Like, it'll check in your local project mm -hmm. first, I think. Mm -hmm. And then if it's not there, it'll go to your global mm -hmm. installs. Okay. So, and what is the... There is, there is a way to make it though, so you can just type I through. Okay. Through. okay. So what does the X stand for in NPX? Um, I'm not, I'm pretty sure it's just like, so there's the node package that right? mm -hmm. and I think that X just stands for like execute or something like execute. that. Execute. So we would just run uh, a script or something to write okay. that exactly sure what it's like. And when you build React, do you use the WebStorm IDE or do you use um, a different one? I actually use NPX, ironically. So oh, they have you can own. actually um, run the create React app command without installing mm -hmm. anything, mm -hmm. just by typing NPX before it, and it'll go and pull it from, right. I think, from the website. Right. Not exactly. But like, like if you're building up a big website from scratch, um, like React based, what IDE would you use? Um, WebStorm is really good. Yeah, sure, Visual. WebStorm. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people are using now uh, Visual Studio Code. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called. Yeah. But, but, I think it's personal brand. Yeah, it's just whatever you feel comfortable with. I, I do think that the uh, WebStorm is really good because it already has everything built in. You don't have to right. actually download plugins and install them. Right. And it's it's just out of the box. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't need to learn that. You need to right learn <laughs> the code, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Do you know React pretty well, or do you? Use mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess okay. somewhat. Cool. Yeah, I mean, not the webhooks are the 
the card that I struggle with. Mm, web hooks. Yeah, just because. I just no. learned about those today. React hooks, yeah. The React hooks are annoying. I don't, especially because when you have an internal state or a smart container, mm -hmm. it just becomes an issue with performance. Updating the state doesn't update uh, real t in real time. Mm -hmm. So, so are, like, are these the hooks you're thinking of? Or are you talking about different hooks? Yeah, like, yeah, it's the life cycle. Yeah. Okay. So there is a, yeah, before it used to be in a class, now they're React hooks. Um, I think it is. Yeah, it sounds like they're doing away with class. Well, not doing away with. You can still use classes, but that's not the modern way of. They just changed the paradigm that they. The paradigm. Yeah. To use functions with hooks. Yes, that's functional programming. Functional programming. Okay. Interesting. So for somebody that's learning React like myself, is it good to know how to build classes anyway? Or should I wean myself off of building classes as soon as possible? Mm -hmm. Sorry. No worries. I will recommend to learn first of the oriented programming. Mm -hmm. That will give you a full um, understanding of what is a class, mm -hmm. where the pillars of object in the programming okay. helps you to understand concepts like inheritance. Mm -hmm. That way you will actually understand what you're doing with, with uh, React classes. Okay. And that can be translated to pretty much any language mm -hmm. that allows you to do object in the programming the same way that you do something like with React. So that that's would be my say, just learn core concept, mm -hmm. not necessarily learn React using classes. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ray. There was a chance to get out of some that like the React app is using the last thing. And it's like all mm -hmm. kind of folder and I want you to like start up and do things around. So okay. it might not be a bad idea to like at least understand it. Yeah. Okay. Uh oh. Sorry for the people on online. I realize now that there's some sort of audio on my computer that's going through that shouldn't be. <laughs> I, I hope it's not something too political. It probably is. I don't know what this is. Dang it! What's making noises on my computer? Stop! Oh, is it Twitch? Do we have a... Sorry, people. Access? Yes. Yeah. Did that work? <laughs> Oh. oh, what? Does anybody know that feature that lets you know which tab is playing audio? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to switch this over to being a different audio. Okay, sorry everybody that's online. Come on. This doesn't sound like something I listen to any, anyway. I cannot tell what's making the noise. I think there's a... No. <laughs> there's a blood news on the manager. You're using Chrome? Ah, uh, Brave, yeah. I'm just going to quit it out. Just kind of like do it Yeah, just kill the process. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm going to restart the stream too, just because um, that, well, uh, I can edit it out later. I don't want to get some sort of copyright violation. Mm. Okay. So, while I'm sorting this out, um, let's just go around the room and do names real quick. So I'll start because I'm AJ, and uh, and where where Jeff go? Jeff Jeff is our gracious host, um, and I'm our gracious organizer. So I'm AJ, 
I've been doing Node since before it was Node. Actually, it was always Node, but since the, the point two days. Um, and, uh, well, I'll, I'll introduce myself more when I actually give the presentation tonight. But uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just go right along. So I work, I work at a company called Savvy and Provo. I also do side work stuff. I've got a YouTube channel. I manage meetups. Um, I'm a technophobic technologist. That's, that's what I do. And then we have Michael. Michael. I've never been to these before. Excited to be here. I do work at, at FedEx uh, and a, a software analyst for 3M. And, um, and now I'm here. <laughs> I'm Jake. Nice to meet you guys. Um, blueberry Pop Tarts are the best flavor. And that's about it. Agreed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not the chocolate ones. Not cherry. Not cherry. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I'm Alex. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, the PS is cool. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Mm -hmm. I'm CC, I do full stack at a company called Lashbrook, just not too far from here. What's the name of the company? Lashbrook. 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 Mm -hmm. Everyone, I'm John. Um, started at a company about a year ago. I've been doing um, mostly front end work, but trying to get into full stack. So, yeah, excited to be here and learn some more. So, hi, my name is Um I work a company called White. It's uh, Jordan. It's more like Jolly Moss like front end and back end. But I try to get get more skill in the back end. Yeah, my name's Kyle. Uh, I'm in a coding boot camp right now and being trained up to be a software developer. So JavaScript is one of my favorite languages and I'm just happy to be here. And I'm actively looking for jobs. Um, level level one type software jobs. So, if you're hiring and you are looking for a good engineer, uh, come talk to me. Um, I'm a senior engineer at. I, I just moved to cloud engineer DevOps. I um, working at Job Nimbus. Um, nice. Yeah, uh, it's great. I like it. Uh, I like Node. I like C sharp. I like a lot of languages. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's pretty much me. I have, yeah. So. All right. So I am Harvey. Uh, I just learning. <laughs> All right. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to kind of get a gauge before we get started. Who here has uh, zero experience with Node.js? Really? Because you've been to the meetups a few times now. But it's always been JavaScript. <laughs> have we ever really covered Node? I guess, I guess since you've started coming, we haven't done a Node-specific thing. It's just been JavaScript. Okay. Yep. So who's got uh, uh, less than three months of experience? Less than six months experience? Less than four years experience? Okay, great. That covers everybody. We've reached <laughs> Unity. Excellent. Okay. So I think... Uh, those of you that have less than three months of experience with Node, do you have more than that experience with JavaScript? Okay, because that's one of the things where I wasn't really sure how to gauge this. I did send out a, a question response to say, hey, what, what do you all want to learn? And you all just left it entirely up to me. You gave me no, no response on that meetup email that went out. Yes? We like the initial. <laughs> we didn't need anything else. Oh, yeah. Same with Node. We liked it. Yeah, well, I mean, it, but it could go a lot of ways. All right, so what I'm going to do, oh, and also, oh, sorry, yes, to those of you joining in online, go ahead and, and uh, let me know, and I'll read that off real quick. So uh, Dane, also working full stack skills, starting to apply for jobs in the springtime. DM me with advice if you have any on Twitter, at Dane Duffy, no note experience. Okay, um, and then I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let this timer elapse the whole full, full five minutes. I'm actually going to get rid of that in just a second. Um, do we have anybody else online that wants to introduce? I see we've got several people watching. I'll give you about uh, 15, well, I guess 30 seconds because online it lags behind a little bit. And all right, so this, what I've done is I've prepared some slides and I, they're, they're not the right slides because I didn't know what the audience was, but there's a bunch of them 
and we can stop at any time, ask questions, no questions or dumb questions, except I will let you know if you ask a dumb question. I can judge. I can tell. I can tell the dumb questions. So, but um, that aside, it, you can feel free to interrupt any time. So that all said, I'm going to go ahead and move us on over into the uh, presentation state here. Uh, let's see if I can get that to the point. Uh, there we are. Uh, excellent. Okay. So, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome out tonight to Utah Node.js. Thanks again to Vivint for hosting us at their wonderful Lehigh location. And thanks to Jeff, who is, I think, still manning the door and letting people in uh, for being our, our gracious host. Uh, I'm A.J. O'Neill. I'm going to be presenting tonight. And the topic is navigating Node.js in 2022. And the idea is kind of to have this be a beginner-ish guide because I don't know what level you're at, but if you haven't done any programming or any JavaScript, then ask lots of questions. But uh, I don't, I, 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 I'm not actually really good at beginner's guide. I probably shouldn't have said that. But it's the new year, and people are looking to get into new things, and so we have to you know, play to the market and all that. So that all said, uh, yeah, AJ O'Neill, at Beyond Code, underscore Beyond Code on Twitter. That is the, the good content. Uh, none of my political opinions or or um, it just random ramblings and nonsense. That one, that's the Twitter that you probably want to follow. And then the Twitch is all the stuff that I do, including this right now, streaming on Twitch. And I will try to keep an eye on the chat if anybody does jump in on the chat. So I classify myself, uh, I ident uh, <clears throat> no, we're not gonna do that. Uh, I'm a technophobic technologist, I'm a dangerous wrong thinker, and I'm an equal opportunity offender. So, you know, that will help us get along well. You know, set the expect expectations in the wrong place. We're talking tonight about Node.js. And just in case anybody else actually wants official uh, brand kit material for all of the things where I included logos, I tried to include the brand links down below so that you know where to get it because it's always annoying when there's six million different old logos of things. That's completely irrelevant to the talk, but, you know. <laughs> um, so, oh yeah, this is Node.js. <laughs> Node.js is a dumpster fire. More on that in a moment. Uh, and it's a dumpster fire because there are too many cooks in the kitchen. And this is why you are here, because you wanted to hear my very opinionated opinion of how to get started the right way, and that's what I'm going to help you out. So uh, if you examine this carefully collected study from uh, this last year, uh, in a poll of 100% of people, we found that ECMAScript has a learning curve that looks like a fern curled up on itself, as opposed to, say, Go uh, or Rust. The other languages that uh, you'll see me at meetups for. So with Rust, that doesn't really look like a curve. <laughs> yeah, remember, there's the beginner's guide that's this thick, and then there's the advanced book. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you haven't seen the beginner's guide to Rust, is flipping. Blah, blah, blah. But the, but then the the advanced topics book is just a few chapters long. <laughs> so yeah, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll get to all of this uh, as we go. So. We're going to go over why Node.js, how to install it, what tools you need, hello world, and we probably won't get to the web server. In fact, we probably won't even get into much of the hello world. Uh, we'll see. We'll see where things lead. But when there's great options out there, like Go and Rust, why in the world would you pick Node.js? That seems so bad. And the answer is, I think I put something here. Ah, there we go. Uh, the answer comes from our good friend Douglas Crockford, which you have, if you haven't watched the Crockford Talks, I do have a playlist with them on the Beyond Code Bootcamp YouTube channel. But he says, you're not paid to abuse every feature of a language. You're paid to write correct programs. I think he actually said we in, in his quote. I, I got it slightly wrong. It's not 100%, but that's basically it. So my point with that is that JavaScript, so I said there's too many cooks in the kitchen. JavaScript has been managed by committee. It's been managed by committee over a couple of decades. It changed hands between, I think it was originally mostly Microsoft and then Yahoo took it and then the Ruby people took it and then now it's back to Microsoft again. And so basically everybody hates JavaScript except for the person that designed it and all the people on the committee except for Douglas Crockford, their primary goal is to turn it into a completely different language and they have succeeded. So if you look at JavaScript from um, literally... 2005, and you look at ECMAScript today, there is nothing syntactically the same between the two languages uh, other than the keyword for uh, and the keyword return. 
which those are syntactically the same among most languages. So uh, we have this problem of there's too much JavaScript. And my, my plea to you is actually going to be to learn as little as you can so that you can be productive and not get lost in the weeds of all the possibilities. Um, because it is possible to be good at JavaScript, but it's not really possible to be good at ECMAScript because there's just too much of it uh, if we classify them as separate languages. Uh, less is more. So that's, that's my first call is just to try to learn less JavaScript. Don't try to learn everything about it. Try to learn only the things that actually seem essential. And you will probably do better and be more productive. Uh, so let's talk about the benefits of specifically Node.js in comparison to the other languages that I was talking about before. One thing that's really great about it is that it has single threaded execution, which if you're not familiar with system languages, you probably have no idea what that means. Essentially, it means that if you have a block of code, and this is a lot easier to say before the introduction of async await, so we're going to ignore async await for just a moment to, for this example, because it's a lot easier. If you have a block of code in a function, Every line of that function will complete before anything else can happen. So JavaScript can only do things in between functions. Now with the introduction of async await, which if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it right now. But with the introduction of that, it is syntax sugar. Basically when you feed in the program, it does a find and replace. And everywhere there's an await, it replaces it with essentially another function, which means that everywhere you see an await, something else could happen differently, um, which makes it a little bit more difficult to explain this. But if I have two cups, and this cup occupies this space on the table, and I go to put this cup here, I can't do it because it's the real world, right? But my basically the, the condition that's bad that happens is when, when the computer program, one function starts to say, put this cup in this location, this memory location and the other function says to do the same thing, and then you end up with a, a, an amalgamous single cup that is in an unknown state, and your program generally crashes that, at that point, if you're lucky, and if you're not lucky, it crashes later. And if you're supremely unlucky, people just get bad data in the database. So this is something that JavaScript does really well that we like, is that it has single-threaded execution, so it actually can do multiple things at a time, just like most other modern languages, but it, from the perspective of the code you write, the, f the things that you see on the line of the function, those complete before something else can happen. And, and so uh, you can never have a line from two functions executing at the same time. Um, any, any questions about that? Yeah, so is a thread just a reference to like literally a thread on the CPU? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then... JavaScript is event-oriented, which makes it, high. oh, that, uh, I was giving some comparisons here. So Rust cannot have data races as part of its language design. JavaScript can also not have data races uh, as part of its language design. Um, JavaScript is highly concurrent, like what Go is. So we've got a lot of really great advantages right off the bat. Highly concurrent, meaning that, uh, so this is the difference between parallel and concurrent. Parallel means that two things happen at exactly the same time that you can run into the problem with the cup. Concurrent means the two things can be happening, but not necessarily in the same space at the same time. So when you fire off four network requests, under the hood, JavaScript actually has four threads, or at least four pools, uh, or, or places for an event to happen. And four things actually are happening at the same time, but they're happening in their own space. And the, only when, when the action is done, and the function returns, and there's there's a room for an, another function to run again, is anything done with that data? So it's kept in its own separate safe space until that point. And there's no other language that I know of that is event oriented. JavaScript is the only one, but it's this combination of these two things that make it unique and actually pretty good. And when all things are considered, because of the way we're actually running applications today, where we Dockerize things we basically deploy an application to a single virtualized CPU. We typically don't run an application on three or four virtualized CPUs at the same time. So 
the kind of benefits that you get from Rust and Go in some ways don't matter in the world of JavaScript, in the world that we live in today, because of the way that we actually use computers. Go was designed uh, at a time when we thought we were going to be running more CPU cores at a time. It turns out for local desktop development that's true, but it's not for web development in the general case. There's exceptions to that, of course. Okay. And then uh, the other benefit of Node.js and JavaScript is that it, it is actually quite modern. JavaScript is actually a leader. It got a lot of features right before any other languages did. So before Java was async, before C Sharp was async, before Go or Rust were invented, JavaScript had this paradigm of being functional, meaning that uh, in, in the JavaScript sense it's functional, meaning that the... Oh, let me block this bot here that's dropping nasty links in the channel. Um, in that functions are just values in the way, same way that numbers are values or that objects are values or that arrays are values. It got duct typing right. Uh, you can access a property that doesn't exist and that's okay. It doesn't crash the program. So you can, you can inspect an object and see if it has a property and move on uh, in, in one direction or another. And also it has the concept of pure objects, which is something that most other languages didn't really have. Uh, object, quote unquote, object oriented, which is a complete abuse of the term, they're actually class oriented languages, were all the rage at the time. And so in order to have an, a value, you had to have a class to encapsulate that value. So not that all of this is anything special today, but it's just interesting that JavaScript was really kind of, the, well, the first of its kind, the worst of its kind, uh, is, is the, the little jingle I like to use. But it brought a lot of things into programming that weren't mainstream before and are mainstream now because of, of JavaScript. So a lot of benefits to it. And it's great for web services. So Node in particular is just, it's amazing because when we're talking about an environment where we're running virtualized computers and each instance gets a, a single virtualized core, you really can't hope for better than what Node gives you. You can't get better performance with Go. Well, you kind of can, you know, it all depends on what your implementation details are, but Go doesn't necessarily excel in that environment. And Rust does, Rust is really great at taking advantage of every CPU cycle, but at the cost of it's you know high learning curve and then all the other languages eh, to me they're just kind of meh they're not that interesting but uh node makes it really easy to just get a simple web server up and running and this is kind of an example of what that might look like and i'm going to talk about async router later on but this is one peg this mark this highlight this you know at root async router is what you ought to use if you are doing routes and express uh, because it gives you, I, we'll go we'll go into it later. But take take note of that. I promise you. I promise you. You will love your life more if you use uh, at root async router, um, because it will it, better error handling and better response hand, handling for your Express apps without any without having to change anything, without having to break anything with stuff that already works. Uh, also, there is. It, so Node is pretty usable in general for command line utilities. We know this because every command line utility in existence has been rewritten in Node and anything that you want to do with web development, you have to install Node and then you have to NPM install something. Uh, but it's also, there's, there's a thing that Google put out called ZX that I will highlight here because it makes just general scripting a heck of a lot easier um, by using basically string templates. So this is something that many of you may not immediately need, but I do, do just want to point this out to you because this is a new tool that we have that we didn't have before. And um, it, it, if you just want to write quick scripts and you're, you're comfortable with ensuring that Node is on the system that you want the script to run on, this new system ZX is actually quite good. Okay, so those are some highlights. Oh, and then, of course, the, the, one of the major benefits to Node is that it's there. It's everywhere. Anywhere you want to be, it's there. Nobody's going to argue against you. Well, I mean, you can't say nobody, but uh, for starting a little Node app at your job, whatever you're doing, this, it's expected. You're already using Node for something, so it's really easy to get in the door, even if you're at a Java shop. If you're at a Java shop and you have something that's webby, 
somebody's using Node to compile some CSS or something, so there's already expertise no matter where you go. It is inescapable. It will be there. And so this is a great benefit to it. Okay, now let's talk about things that suck about Node. Uh, and somewhat JavaScript in general, but especially Node. Uh, too much legacy. Node, like I said before, it's a dumpster fire. One of the reasons it's a dumpster fire, it was created by college kids who had no idea what they were doing. They struck gold on the first try, and then they grew up and left. So none of the people that were in the Node community back in the beginning are still there now because they got interested in Go and Rust and other languages and decided, crap, I created a terrible mess. I don't know how to fix it. I'll abandon it instead. And yet, despite that half of the popular modules that we use have no maintainers, the world goes on. Um, but this is also a problem with, uh, there, it was so much hype that there are too many different standards and ways of coding in Node. And so I can't show you an example of Node that is, um, n that is not, that, that someone cannot easily argue against this isn't good Node code because they say, oh, well, no, Node code should look like this or it should look like that or you should use TypeScript and transpile, et cetera, et cetera. That's part of it. Uh, well, this is actually, I was just going into that same thing here. So there's no cohesion. Uh, there's, there's just too many different ways of doing things. It's really hard. Like I said, less is more. And then uh, Dino is a better evolution, uh, Kierglow says. And that, have any of you heard of Dino? Yes. Yeah. So I kind of agree with that to some respect in that at least they took a stand to say, hey, we're, we're, but they kind of abandoned JavaScript in favor of TypeScript, which I guess if, you go, if you're going to make that your stance, that's fine, as, lo as long as you're going to do that. But um, yeah, Dino is not getting the traction that I thought that it would, and I think part of that m maybe, maybe has to do with the, uh, the pandemic because everything shut down and all the meetups shut down, and so the opportunities to meet and learn kind of shut down with that. So it may have just been released at the wrong time, but I do think there's some great stuff about it. Um, I no longer see it overshadowing or overtaking Node. I just don't. I think Rust and Go are too good if you're looking for an alternative and too sane because their type systems are thought out by people that didn't hate themselves. Whereas Microsoft really, read the Wikipedia page, they're just trying to repurpose their C-sharp developers and that's why TypeScript exists. Uh, the other thing that's really rough and this I've been talking about, is just really, 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 really bad docs. 80% of the material out there is bad and you shouldn't follow it, which I don't have a good solution for you in terms of, well, because if you go into the Go community or the Rust community, you're going to find good docs from people that know what they're talking about. There's, there's two or three websites I can point you to, and we say these are the websites you should learn from. When it comes to Node, I have no such solace for you because... Everybody does things a different way, and there are, I, in my mind, I have not found good authoritative sources where it's like, ah, oh, yeah, if you follow the guides on this website, you're going to have a good time. These people know what they're doing. Uh, it's one of those marketing hypes where it's easier to sell uh, blogs and get ad revenue for bad programming articles than it is to write good programming articles. Um, so and that's where I come in. Hold my Mountain Dew. I'm going to help you out best I can. So, uh, first thing that we need to start with is actually going to be, of course, installing Node. And I think this is a major source of headache. So, uh, I want to get through that first. If you go to the Node website, you're going to either click a button that's going to give you the wrong installer, and then you're going to install that, and then you're going to have problems with it, or you're going to click the other downloads or see all downloads, and then you're going to be given a bunch of installers that don't have any instructions on how to use them appropriately. So these are the good, oh no, these are the bad installers that you'll get if you just click uh, randomly. So you're gonna have three terrible options depending on what your operating system is. If you're installing on Windows, you're gonna get an MSI that's gonna require administrative privileges and is going to screw up your system level node installer and uh, put that in your path for you, which is the benefit. And then if you get the Mac version, you're going to get a .pkg that when you open it up requires administrative privileges and then is going to change permissions on directories on your computer so that then when other programs go to use those directories, they can't use them. And then you're going to be tempted to use sudo for all sorts of other things. And then you're going to end up reinstalling your computer. Or if you're on Linux, good news is you can use apt, but then you're going to get a version of Node that's six years old and NPM won't work. And so this is just a bad story all the way around. Um, 
Oh yeah, sudo is not your friend. Anytime that somebody says use sudo, uh, yeah, if you use it, whatever they're telling you to do, it might work. It will definitely mess up permissions on your computer. It will definitely do that. And then it may make it so that nothing else that you were doing will ever work again unless you also do sudo or you go learn Linux, which if you're gonna be on the back end, you might as well. So that's, you know, maybe that's a plus point. It'll get you to learn system permissions. So in a sane world, this is what you actually want. You want to get the zip and the Mac OS <laughs> binary. But the problem here is that even though those give you this nice self-contained folder that you can move to the trash if you don't want that version anymore, or you can put in a, in a good place so you could have multiple versions, the problem with these is that as, as your functional feeling of using them is that they aren't installed because they don't give you any instruction on how to update what's called your path, which you were having this problem of you, you type in something and hit un enter and it says bash could not find command uh, X. Mm -hmm. And so that you installed something with NPM, NPM's path wasn't set up correctly. And so basically, I don't know which category you fell into, but you fell into a category where you used an installer that put stuff in a place that uh, in the system path wasn't updated correctly or your user path wasn't updated correctly. And now you have to do these wonky workarounds and tutorials aren't working, et cetera. So I'm going to tell you how to solve this problem uh, because path is not your friend. Uh, it, you should, if you're going to be a backend developer, you should learn about path. But I'm not going to teach you about path now. I'm going to teach you how to not have to worry about path for Node to work for you. Um, oh, and Brew is not your friend either because Brew will mess things up on your computer. Too. Any, anybody use Brew and then had to had to mess libssl? Anybody libssl? Did you have that problem or? Okay, libssl is the problem that it, that I have with Brew. It it puts one basically it, it Brew by default installs to the system directory and then it has custom versions of popular libraries such as libssl, which is used by every program on your computer. And so sometimes Brew will end up putting lib, its libssl in the path ahead of precedence of the system libssl or other libraries that are similar to this, uh, GitOpsC Git or something like that. And so then programs start breaking. Um, and yeah, so this, but here's my solution for that, is that Webby is your friend. So webinstall.dev, if you go to webinstall.dev slash node, uninstall the node that you have, Uninstall brew. I'm serious about this. You will not regret this. You will not regret this. So uninstall node however you got installed. Uninstall brew however you got that installed. Okay? And all you have to do is copy and paste this, and it'll work on Windows, Mac, and Linux. The command is slightly different for Windows. But you copy and paste this, and I guarantee you, I will give you, I will buy you lunch if it, if it doesn't work and... There's not something seriously wrong with your system from some other thing that you did before. Because, you know, if your system's already royally screwed up and you have to reinstall it anyway, this is not going to magically fix your computer. But um, this will give you a user-scoped installation of Node, and it will allow you to switch between versions of Node. And somebody asked on the chat, why not use NVM? Yeah. So this will do you one better than NVM because it actually will keep each installation of Node separate. So you won't have conflicts like you do with NVM where you install something with one version of Node, switch versions of Node, and now something that you installed previously doesn't work anymore because it's got some wrong dependency somewhere in the chain. So this will give you completely separate installations of Node that are isolated from each other, that are conflict-free, that don't go into a system path. And so I guarantee you this will work. Thousands of people have enjoyed it, and it's working, um, it's working great. So the other thing is that if you must install Brew, which eventually you're going to have to install Brew, use Webby to install Brew. Uninstall Brew the way that it came, use Webby to install Brew. Webby will install Brew again into a system. And, and, it, and this is all, there's nothing special here. Well, there is one thing special. It updates your path automatically. But other than that, this is just taking the tarball from the Node website, downloading the same thing that we just looked at, and then it just runs a script to update your path appropriately, detecting whether you're using Fish or ZSH or Bash or you're on Windows, and it does the right thing. And then likewise with Brew, Brew does have official instructions on how to install Brew conflict-free. There's just a couple of flags that you need to pass in order for Brew to install what I would consider to be correctly. However, that's not the default install with Brew, and if you install Brew from Webby, and also in the page, 
uh, it will tell you exactly what's being done differently so that the, there's no ambiguity. You can always go, if somebody says, why is your node different? Why is your brew different? You can go to webinstall.dev slash node, webinstall.dev slash brew, and it says right there, this is what's different from the, any, any other type of installer, the things that somebody would need to know. And what you're going to find is that all it's doing is making it so it's conflict-free. There's no weird special settings. With Node, there is one thing that it does that's unusual, which is basically fixing a bug in Node NPM uh, paths that have been kept there for compatibility with some program for some reason or other. But by default, if you have multiple versions of Node installed on your computer and you start a program with one version of Node, it, if it needs to do any subtasks, if it needs to spawn NPM or spawn any child processes, by default, for some weird reason that I don't understand, but this behavior has been preserved, it will go find whatever is the, the default node in the path and use that one instead. So if you start with node V14, you could end up still executing parts of your program with node V16. And there's just one little lesser known option in the NPM RC that changes this behavior so that if you start it with a version of Node, everything that runs as a child process of that version of Node will run with the same version of Node. Again, I have no idea why you'd want the other behavior, um, but that is what you get here. So, Wait, so what you're recommending is completely uninstalled brew and, uh, and then just you play the Yep. 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 And I'd recommend not installing Brew unless you need to. I would love to know if there's something that you actually believe that you need that is not available via Webby. I'd love to know about it because me and my buddy maintain it, and we want to help people the best way we can. And I just think it's unreasonable to have to install 500 megabytes of uh, 790,000 commits of history on things that you don't need in order to uh, do something that should take two seconds. So Webby is fast and easy. Okay, so yeah, like I was saying, Webby is gonna get you, it's it's downloading from the official Node website. It ha Node has an API that gives release versions and stuff, so it just basically takes that file, parses it, and for most things it gets it directly off of GitHub releases, but for Node it has to be special because Node doesn't use GitHub releases. But all the same, you're not getting a custom build. That's one of the things I don't like about Brew is it often gives you custom build. Same thing with Apt. Apt is terrible with putting patch versions in that are special patch versions for Debian. So they fixed a bug in Node that maybe, I don't know. But you just you end up with a different version of Node from what mainline Node is. You end up with Node flavored a little bit for Debian in the way that it interprets paths or the way that it does this, that, or the other. Okay, so Webby makes it fast. Uh, it's the fastest way to download because you only download what you need. It's the fastest way to set up because all it's doing is moving things in a folder and adding something into your bash file and asking you to close your terminal open again, and it's conflict-free. So I recommend this. I mean, I built it because I had a problem and I work with clients and I work with other people who work with clients and we had a problem where people couldn't get things installed correctly and Webby was our solution. Isolate it, make it conflict-free, make it simple, make it small. Okay, so, um, and I talked about, yeah, you get the cheat sheet on there. So that's, that's the number one thing is just get Node installed pretty much as vanilla as you can, even more vanilla than what the PKG installer from the Node website will do for you. And I promise you, you will have a better time. You will not regret it. Okay, uh, next is tools. Now we're not even talking about programming. And you think, okay, well, I said this is going to be a beginner's guide to Node. But the programming is not that important because like I said, I can tell you about the programming pieces and you can believe me or you cannot believe me. You can go look at a bunch of tutorials. I can only help you so much with that stuff. And you know, we can go through that later and you can ask me questions. But the tooling I think is undisputable. You need to have good tooling. And the reason is very simple. Your brain is small, you suck at code. Because <laughs> you are human. So this is the way that it is. This is not disputable. I suck at code, you suck at code, you suck at code, you suck at code, you suck at code. Everybody sucks at code, right? And your brain is small, and your brain is small, and your brain is small, everybody's brain is small. So what we need to do as programmers, the most important thing as programmers is we're systematizing, right? We're trying to find areas where there is something that can be automated. And we can automate away tasks from our brain. And so that's what we want to do. 11 out of 10 dentists agree, typing is the leading cause of typos. 
verifiable statement. We'll provide sources upon request. So uh, tools that I'm going to recommend are right here, and we're going to go through each of them. Um, the first one is Vim Essentials. Now, you may not use Vim. That's your problem. You need to get over that. Uh, but Vim, it, I don't like Vim. Let me tell you why I don't like Vim. I don't like Vim because everybody in the Vim community loves Vim. They love it to the point that they don't remember how they got started with it. And so if you ask a simple question like, hey, how did you do that? Then they go on a long tirade and start showing you 50 lines of Vim script and then want you to install 6 million things and, and then it's just, it's overwhelming. You know what's not complicated about Vim? Learning how to navigate the arrow keys with your right hand and uh, navigate the edit keys with your left hand. That's really not hard. That takes about 10 minutes. What's hard about Vim is when you interface with people that use Vim and they make it sound as if it's the most complicated thing in the world when it doesn't have to be. So Vim Essentials basically gives you the kind of IDE experience that you probably want with hardly any special configuration and everything that is modified goes into the Vim RC. So if a Vim expert came to you and said, oh, how did you do that? That's so cool. Or, oh, let me you know, get this thing set up, but I need to know if you have something that might conflict with that. In the VimRC, everything has a comment and uh, has its own little config file so that if, if a Vim expert wanted to help you, they could open up your VimRC, or you could if you want to become a Vim expert, and they could see exactly what's going on without being confused at all, and it's all very standard stuff that they would have already seen before. It's a very limited set of, of um, modules for Vim. And if you use VS Code, that's... Uh, well, let me finish this first. So if, you, if you're not convinced that you need to learn Vim, if you're going to be a back-end developer, you do, because Vim is everywhere. Vim, you know, if you were to, to hack into a PlayStation, Vim would be there, right? If you could get into an Apple Watch, Vim's going to be there. On your router at home, your router runs Linux. It might run it illegally. There's lawsuits about this all the time because router manufacturers put Linux on there because that's what routers run on. And then they don't give the proper attribution or make the source code available or they make special modifications to the kernel for one of their special drivers on the board and just you know, hope that no one's going to notice that they violated the GPL. Anyway, your router runs Linux and Vim is on your router. So because it's so ubiquitous, Vim is going to be, you can easily get it in your Docker containers. Oftentimes we slim down Docker containers so that there's nothing there. But uh, you, can, you can get Vim everywhere. Vim is everywhere by default. And that makes it an asset, um, in my opinion. It works on Windows, it works on Mac, it works on VMs. It, you know, anywhere you want to be, Vim is there. And you can't, it, the, the story with VS Code and remote editing is getting a lot better, but it's not, it's still just not great. It's, it's just not as reliable. Um, Vim is going to be anywhere that you need, anywhere Node is, Vim is going to be there too. All right. So that's, and, and, and then my derogatory caption here, just learn how to use the computer already. You know, just take the 10 minutes to do it. It's, uh, you don't, again, less is more. Don't get a Vim expert to teach you how to learn Vim because they're going to fill your head with so many things that you'll never be able to contain it. Get a Vim idiot to teach you how to use Vim and they'll tell you, okay, here's the five things I've been using for the last five years that everyone criticizes me for, but hey, I get my work done, okay? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so are you back end or not? You gotta, you gotta, it. but VS Code, I get, yeah, maybe you're gonna use that and that's fine. Um, it has, I just don't know as well how to automate the installation process for VS Code to say, okay, here's a VS Code config that's just gonna work and you don't have to go fidget with settings. So that's one of my arguments for Vim too is that I literally created a script that installs a Vim config that any Vim nerd that you ever speak to, if they looked at their, your Vim config, they would not hate you. <laughs> because you know these are very opinionated people, but I've chosen things that are just the most basic things that are gonna give you your syntax highlighting, that are gonna give you your error messages, that are gonna give you the, the basic things that you expect from an IDE. The one thing that I don't think I have turned on by default is auto-completion, and that's because auto-completion is a little tricky and there's a bunch of different ways to do it, and I haven't found a way that suits me because I don't like it if I'm typing and then it gets slower to type because auto-complete is going. And I also, one thing I hate about VS Code is that every time you move your cursor, it's like popping up and popping up and pop It's like, I want to read the code. I don't want to read the documentation. I've got the documentation on my second monitor. If you don't have two monitors, get two monitors. Put the documentation on this monitor, write your code on this monitor. That's literally how I do it at work. Documentation's here, code's here. You know, it's, 
It works great. Um, but if you like all those pop-ups and everything every five seconds, it, good, good for you. Okay. So uh, now to do a quick spot check before I go further, which I don't know that that's actually necessary. I should have just gone through with the rest of this, but we'll, we'll see. Um, does everybody know what functions, everybody knows what functions are. A, do you get the, the, the general how events work in JavaScript or not get how events work in JavaScript? Like an event handler type thing, like on click or? Uh, any, any events. So the event loop, let's say the event loop. Okay, primitives, variables, promises. Promises is often a sore point for people. So I get some kind of half nods. Regular expressions, good. If you're gonna be a back-end person, you need to know regular expressions. Um, require, you've got experience with require. Process, don't know what process is? Okay, we'll, we'll maybe talk, when that comes up, we'll talk about it again. A module scope, as how it's different from, okay, so most of these things it sounds like y'all know, but I just kind of want to do a quick check because I'm going to show you some code in a second, and I don't want the code to be distracting. I want the code to be uh, exemplary, but I made the code real code rather than just being literally hello world, because a lot of times hello world isn't very helpful. Um, so, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll move on with that. Um, prettier, I actually am going to open up the prettier rationale. I think that that is worth opening up, if I can get it open here. Can I open this? Oh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to do, uh, let's go back. Uh, Oh no! Okay, can I do it this way? Can I still get, no, it won't give me tabs? No. Oh, meh. I had tabs before. Why don't I have tabs now? Um, so, some people use different tools for formatting. Prettier is the only tool you should do, learn. And, 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 and anybody that says otherwise, you should uh, smack them in the face. With love, kindly. And the reason for this is Prettier was actually one of the few tools that is caught on that's very popular. It was designed by software engineers. Uh, software engineering, as opposed to coding, software engineering is respect to code in regards to how code persists across time and people. So that's what software engineering is about. There's a really good definition for it that um, is basically that, but I'm slightly misquoting it. But software engineering is about code across time and people. And the prettier people, they get that. And so if you read the prettier rationale, first of all, you'll learn how to be a better programmer just by reading this rationale. You'll learn a lot of great things. But prettier is concerned about, one, taking away all the bickering. There's very few options for prettier, which is great. And uh, to making it so that your code is more readable and more correct. And this is objective. Now, there are some people, just, just in the same way that some people have autism or some people have dyslexia, there are certain brain styles that go against the grain that the other 99% of us have. However, as humans, we evolved with our eyes facing forward and two of them, two, two eyes. Uh, what did I say before? Did I? Facing forward. Okay. Two, right. eyes facing two eyes facing forward. So we have all the two <laughs> eyes facing forward side by side, which gives us our lovely uh, 16 9 TV screen or our 2 1 cinematic screen. Like this is based off of this, right? We are programmed by biology, by whatever means it was that we came to be, that we can read easier from top to bottom than from right to left. This is just the way that it is. It doesn't really, it, it, a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to increase my, the width size of my text because my screen is wide, therefore my code should be wide. And this is really silly. This is like saying, oh, here's a loaf of bread, therefore my sandwich should be big. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. It makes perfect sense. So, but, but that's, that's the thing. And they, they enumerate these types of things, these fallacies where we, we think, oh, because we have an affordance, such as a widescreen, we must use it because it'll be better if we use it. But this is just not true. Um, and, it, and, and you know, another way you can think about it is PowerPoint presentations. Anybody who's ever taught you, whether it was in elementary school or whatever, they taught you that when you do a PowerPoint presentation, you make it short and you do bullet points. And that's what code should read like. Code should be very long, very, very long from top to bottom. It should not be very long at all from left to right. And so just that's one example, but there's lots of different things that they bring up that I recommend that you read through 
and uh, see what you agree with and what you disagree with. But these are smart people that are thinking about things the right way as software engineers. And uh, ES Lint can do formatting, but it gives you a ton of options. And you don't need options because the options are not options that enhance the quality of your life. Code is functional. It is not artistic. The art that you create from code is what you are able to produce and deliver to a customer. You may be able to create a pretty screen with the code, but the purpose of the code is not to express how you can join lines together or how you can use clever features of the language to uh, put, you want it to be the most obvious dumb way. If somebody looks at your code and says, it looks like an idiot wrote this, that would be one of the greatest compliments that you could ever receive. <laughs> Unless they meant that you just copied and pasted from Stack Overflow. But um, if somebody were to say, this looks like it was designed for idiots, you have achieved the mark because we want idiots to be able to read code because like I said before, small brains, bad at code, human. Okay. Um, so, and if you install prettier, uh, you, if VS Code, I think you have to install it twice because you have to install it on the command line, then you have to install it in VS Code. Uh, make sure you put your prettier config in, oh yeah, prettier zero BS, I was gonna say that. So you can webby prettier, that's no different from doing npm install dash g prettier, except that in the home directory, Webby will put a little prettier template that you can then use to copy into your projects that's just sane defaults. Well, prettier comes with sane defaults by default, but it's, it's just, uh, yeah, it, it'll put that there for you, and that's nice sometimes. Um, so every package.json that you create should have a prettier line under scripts, and this is exactly what it should look like verbatim. That is it. You don't have to think about it. Now, you may need to have a prettier ignore to exclude a disk directory or a build directory or something like that. Um, but this, this is essentially what it should look like. You don't need to add prettier as a dev dependency. It doesn't need to be installed every time you npm install because prettier is a tool that's used for, it's a tooling tool, yes. I was just going to mention um, something that I've used before with prettier, along with prettier, is Husky. That allowed me to, uh, because running this script is annoying and having a shortcut is annoying, right? So Husky allows me to do a commit hook that, yeah, where I can just uh, prettify the file that, I, that, I, that I've been working on or that I touch or that, or that is in the commit. And that way I don't have to run uh, this script every time or run the shortcut that yep. anybody has. So Husky is a cool tool. I've, I've used it a little bit. I'm not super familiar with it. I don't think that I disagree with it. Uh, but if you're relying on Husky or the script, you're already doing it wrong because it should be baked into your editor. This is more for, for me, sometimes you get people on your team that will refuse to follow code standards because they just, it goes against everything they believe in their soul. And so with this, before I do any sort of refactoring or anything, I can npm run prettier and then I can know. But yeah, Husky's good because if they do a commit, then that should get them right then and there. But anyway, this is what it should look like. And put your prettier config in the prettier config file. Don't put it in the package.json because prettier is a separate tool from package.json. I, I don't know why it's become popular to put config files in package.json, but it has been. This is all you need. Oh, whoops. Where did my... Oh, I had, I had an example file for you. I don't know where it went. We're just going to move on. So JS Hint is another one. Now, I'm not married to JS Hint. There are a few other tools that are like this, but we're just going to use this as the example. I like this one because it is the simplest. And I like things that are simple. It has, it has a very few number of options, which I think is good. But it does have some options, which makes it slightly better than JS Lint. Because JS Lint has no options, and I love Douglas Crockford. He has the right approach about just about everything. But sometimes I give myself the ability to disagree with him and do different than what he says. And JS Hint gives me just that much freedom. Um, so, Doug Crockford said, JS Lint has taught me more than I ever taught it. And you will find this to be true when you are using a linter. Again, the reason I cited Vim Essentials is because Vim Essentials will get it set up so that you have the ale, uh, I forget what that stands for, but basically it is the code tool that no matter what language you're using, it's going to load that code tool tooling when... So you open up a JavaScript file, it knows it's a JavaScript file, it's going to load the JavaScript plugins automatically that are the default plugins that are built into Vim, as well as uh, things like JS Lint, if it finds it, or JS Hint, or ES Lint, or whatever. It'll just, it'll just load those things and it will run them. 
Um, you can configure this in VS Code. Do not use VS Code if you do not configure these things. It is, it is just silliness. But you will find that when you use a linter, you will learn about the language. You will learn about internals of the language that you did not realize. Uh, between Prettier and JS Hint, you're going to catch a ton of errors. Entire categories of errors will just not happen. And one thing I love, uh, this is kind of going back to Prettier, but JS, it's kind of highlighting something that JS Hint would find, is that sometimes in Prettier, the code gets all reformatted really funky in the way that I didn't expect. Dollars to donuts, it was a missing semicolon, and the next line began with a parenthesis. Have you all seen this happen? Yep. Okay, now JS Hint will catch that error even if you're not using Prettier. The, the combination of the two together, ah, match made in heaven. Okay, so uh, you can also get JS Hint with Webby. Uh, again, there's not really much difference there. I don't know that it was even worth me doing it, but I have a cheat sheet for both of these as well. One of the reasons I have Webby is that everything that can be installed with Webby has a cheat sheet that basically says, here's the options that anybody's gonna wanna turn on. Even opinionated people are gonna turn on these options. And here's a link to the official docs. And that, that's true of uh, JS Hint and Prettier. And then, and then some of the things that aren't necessarily in the getting started guide on the docs, but you need to know, like how do I use the ignore file? How do I put this in my package.json? Stuff like that. So again, this is exactly what you need for JS Hint for your package.json. This is it. And again, you could use Husky uh, as well. So it looks like that. And I will give these slides. I should have put them online beforehand. I do have them in the Beyond Code Bootcamp on GitHub. They are in the presentation repository. It's called Prezos, I think. Um, so ESLint is also good, but it's not as simple. I am trying to find a configuration of ESLint that works for me that I eventually abandon JS Hint, but JS Hint has been my primary so far, uh, and that's good. But JS Hint is much smaller in scope, and there are certain features that I want to disable and enable that ESLint is advanced enough to be able to understand, but JS Hint is not. That said, Less is more, uh, you're going to get a lot of value out of JS Hint. But if you use ES Lint, I'm not going to fight you on it unless you require Babel to run your ES Lint, in which case I will fight you. Okay, and then JS Doc. Now, JS Doc gives you documentation. It's really ugly by default. I will eventually get this on Webby and I will get a cheat sheet that shows you how to use a not ugly theme uh, because the default theme is. is but ugly, and it's not hard to get a non-default theme. I just don't remember off the top of my head, and I don't have it in the slides. But JS Doc, the purpose of it, I don't really find that it's it's not necessarily the documentation that I'm after. It's the type hinting, because JS Doc can help specify that you intended something to be of a specific type, and then the linting tooling can say, oh, you're passing a number here, but it looks like this function. Uh, wants uh, a string or the null, but not a number or something like that. Um, so this is what JS doc looks like. It also is just kind of nice. It adds a little bit of a splash of color to your code when you go open the source file on GitHub. Um, it gives you a little bit of space between the code blocks. So it's got an aesthetic to it. Uh, the thing that I don't like about it is that it really wasn't built for JavaScript. It was built for they're trying to copy Java doc, essentially. Um, and that, that shows, but as far as I can tell, every valid program, JavaScript program, can be documented with JS doc. So you don't have to do weird class hierarchies and inheritances and, and uh, interfaces. You don't have to do all that, even though JS doc offers it to you. You can write really simple code and you can document really simple code with JS doc. And so I like that. Um, and then this is the exact command that you need for JS doc, which is not quite um, as simple as some of the other ones in terms of all the different things that you need to pass in order to get it to work reasonably well. Uh, but that is, that is what, and that will output you a web page that shows you. And this is really nice. This is really nice uh, because you, you could create this, you could publish this, you can make it searchable, and you can, you can figure out what your code is doing without actually going through all of your code. Sometimes it is nice to have these high-level overviews of your code. Where are these functions located? I know there's a method by this name. Where was that originally defined? So that, that can be nice. But like I said, primarily I like it for the type hinting. Um, so I don't like TypeScript. I think TypeScript is asinine. I think that C Sharp has its place in the 90s, and we can leave it there. We don't need a new C-sharp scripting language. 
Microsoft does need to not fire all of its C-sharp developers. So Microsoft does need a C-sharp scripting language because C-sharp is going nowhere. The Zoom failed, failed. Uh, Metro failed. Uh, Windows Phone failed. Uh, the, the, the Linux C-sharp thing they were doing failed. Everything Microsoft is doing with C-sharp is not making it outside of Microsoft. C-sharp is not going mainstream. It's just not happening. And the other things are going mainstream and other things are coming into ecosystems in the way that Microsoft cannot avoid it or it doesn't make business sense to avoid it. And so Microsoft needs to do something with those C-sharp developers. Go read the wiki page if you don't believe me because I think that it's, although not explicitly stated, uh, clearly implied. Um, but that said, one thing that I love about TypeScript, uh, the, the, not the language, but the tool, which is called TSC, once it's actually installed, you npm install g TypeScript, and what you get is TSC, which is, I think, the TypeScript checker. But what this will do is it will actually look through all of your code and follow every import and every require, and it will automatically, in most cases, determine what all of the types and functions are. So you get some of the autocomplete, you get the warnings of, hey, uh, you called method get widget. Oh, actually, I think I have this here. Yeah, so you'll get an error for this. So if you do hello answer equals hello world and then you do answer equals 42, you'll get a nice error. A number is not a string because you define this as a string and now you're changing it to a number. That actually is bad for the optimization of the, the V8 internals, the JIT engine. Uh, so in general, you don't want, because JavaScript doesn't have proper shadowing, so you don't want to be changing types of things because then you break the compiler's optimizations. Um, but so you get nice little warnings or, or errors like this. And then also, uh, say you make a typo. You, you did widget.getgizmo, but you meant widget.getgadget. You'll get a nice little error about that and what is and isn't available on the exports of that object. Yes. And that's as you're typing or after compiling? It, it, so uh, for me, I get that stuff as I'm, well, not quite as I'm typing because it's a little bit slow, but basically I save and then a few seconds later, squigglies reappear. Okay. That's how it works for me. But you can get it as you're typing with VS Code if you've got everything configured. However, um, this is not something that has a very intuitive, easy setup for using the, the, the TypeScript checker with vanilla JavaScript. It does it, but uh, this video right here, which is linked at the Beyond Code Bootcamp GitHub JS doc TypeScript starter. If you look at that and watch the video, I explain all the different options and whatnot, uh, at least the ones that I needed in order to do what I needed to do. And I am trying to keep this up to date as documentation for how to do this. So this is, that is the way that I do it, and I, I get benefit out of it. I do have problems sometimes where TypeScript is really, really complex. It is trying to emulate C Sharp on top of JavaScript, so it has all of the complexities of JavaScript and all of the complexities of C Sharp, and it doesn't quite get either of them quite right. So there are occasions where TypeScript just goes absolutely berserk, and one module that comes to mind is Objection which is a, a object relational mapper for Node. That particular module, TypeScript cannot make heads or tails of it when you are in JavaScript. I imagine that if you are in TypeScript, that it can figure it out, but when you're in JavaScript, it thinks that everything is typed incorrectly. No matter what you pass in to any of the methods, it gives you a warning about absolutely everything. That's the only module that I've seen that with. But it is incredibly complex because it's lots of layers on tops of layers on tops of layers. So there's, there's an organism model and then the, the mammal extends that and then human extends that and then employee extends that and then you have all of these different things that are being set up in the classes. It's an incredibly complex class hierarchy you end up working with if you work with objection. And so it has tons of JavaScript style metaprogramming but then it has type definitions added in on top of that. And if what exist is changing as it's being called on in runtime, no compiler can figure that out. So I don't blame it, but just to know there are some rare exceptions where you just have to wholesale ignore an entire category of things from uh, the TypeScript lender. But I, I like it. So, and then re the rest of tools, I recommend that you check out webinstall.dev because we got a lot of good stuff there. And 
uh, you will probably find lots of tools that you like. But those are the ones that are relevant to JavaScript that, oh, well, and TypeScript is not on there. We don't have a cheat sheet for that yet either. But um, anyway, just there's lots of good stuff there. There's some other stuff I'm going to do in next month's presentation uh, when we go over how to set up a web service at, for Reels. So I'm going to use DuckDNS and DigitalOcean and Caddy. And we're going to set up, uh, we're going to get something set up. And it's just, yeah, it's good. Um, so the question may arise, why did I not put GitHub Copilot in the list of tools that you must have? It's the latest, it's the greatest. And the answer is, you don't need AI to autocomplete crap code. You're going to write crap code all on your own. So <laughs> if a mythical day comes when GitHub Copilot, because this is the thing I hear from the experts, okay? These are the people that... And I'm not going to name any names, but you know these are top YouTubers, people in the community give presentations. They say, oh yeah, I love GitHub Copilot. It's so great. It's amazing. I write a comment and it fills out the wrong function. And then all I have to do is go through and edit everything in the function. And it's like, it's magic. And I'm thinking, you wrote a comment. It generated bad code. You spent all of your time correcting the bad code. And you're excited about this because it generated the bad code. You didn't have to write the bad code the first time and correct it. It wrote the bad code for you and all you had to do was correct, okay, you skipped a step, I got it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, have, I have never heard anyone talk about GitHub Copilot. No, I, one person has. Uh, except for one person, everyone that's, that I've heard talk about GitHub Copilot, they say, well, it's really good except that I have to spend a lot of time reading through its, its selections and then not picking them because they're wrong or uh, you know, editing the code. And at that point, it's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, not for me. I don't like things that pop up in my face, as I already said. I, I don't even use autocomplete most of the time because I don't like the auto, you know, I, I hit period and then it's like, oh, what did you want to do? Uh, no, I knew what I wanted to do. I don't, I don't need the dictionary. I actually, I actually knew what I was going to do. I got the documentation page right here. So anyway, it doesn't, doesn't solve a problem that I have. Um, so, yeah. Um, and now... We get to our hello world, and this is where, um, well, first of all, with any questions with that last, any of those last sections there, cut. So is there a difference between TypeScript, like generically, and type, a TypeScript checker? Is TypeScript checker like a lightweight version of TypeScript, or? No, it does the same process, but basically you can tell, so the default behavior of TypeScript is you write TS files, and it it assumes that any .js files are files that have been generated. So you're gonna write TS files and then automagically JS files are gonna be generated. And so it will ignore the JS files. Mm -hmm. But because it has to work in the JavaScript ecosystem, it will read in JavaScript files if you require a JavaScript file. Mm -hmm. And it does a pretty good job. Uh, assuming that the code was written fairly cleanly, it can do a pretty good job of telling what the types are uh, you know, as long as you're not doing too much metaprogramming or overloading or nesting things too deeply, uh, if you're writing good, clean, simple JavaScript code that a Go developer would be proud of, the TypeScript linter is going to almost perfectly understand the intention behind the code. So you can tell TypeScript, hey, I'm actually not writing in TypeScript. I want you to interpret from the top level. Before any requires happen, I want you to interpret the JavaScript that you see as what you're working on. And it will go and follow down, and it, it is quite nice. It, and it will figure things out, and for things that it can't figure out, pretty much all of Node has been definitely typed. And so there's an at types package on NPM that you can install for various things. I, typically, I say just see what it does automagically mm -hmm. and uh, follow that. But if the auto magic isn't good enough, then you might want to npm install the at types file. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, did that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Hello, Iconic, what's up? Nice to see you again. And I'm just gonna block a little spam bot there. <laughs> Feel free to ask any questions, those of you that are online. All right, so now for the, the oh, any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, so for the next portion, yeah, here's your first JavaScript file. Congratulations, you now know Node. I guess I should have told you to put this in a file and run it with the Node command, but ta-da, you're a programmer. 
Um, so my first note to you is that console.log is for burning. You may have noticed that I use console.info. So I have a bunch of rules, as opinionated people do, and one of them is that console.log never makes it into commits. So console.log is for when I am debugging something at the moment before code is ready to do anything. If it is an important message that I actually want a user to see, it is a console.info or a console.error, or if it's an error, but not an error that's gonna cause a catastrophic catastrophic failures such as exiting the application, then it's a console.warn. Console.debug is for when you have the debug flag turned on in the environment or in some option, and only when that flag is on do you use console.debug. So I think that the way that you use console is actually, uh, can be really helpful. Uh, especially, it's just, it's super important that you distinguish between console.log and console.info because otherwise, you're going to mix messages that you actually care about and want to keep on purpose with messages that you just put in there and forgot to remove. So that's, that's, uh, that's my, my first hello world. So now we're going to do a better hello world, and it's going to be a full node package. And we're going to have a useful function that actually does something useful. We're going to have a unit test. We're going to have an export, an import, a whole package. Huzzah. All right. So, uh, yes, our, uh, this is not a useful function. But this is you know, our typical example. Here's a function. And agree, return, blah, blah, blah. All right, we're not going to do that. So messenger.js. Um, I, I, we're we're going to create messenger.js. And here is an important note that you will perhaps rarely see, but is super nice to do. In fact, I think it's uh, one of only two ways that you should ever export modules. Uh, first of all, I don't believe in the new import thing. Eventually, maybe it'll take over. But so far right now, Using import in Node makes no sense because it only causes problems. It does not fix a problem that exists. There is no problem that import fixes, none of them. All the ones that people say it fixes are lies, such as the mythical tree shaking, because that could be done by any code analysis, no matter which keyword you use. And then in browsers, since all the browser stuff is transpiled anyway, import does nothing for browsers because everything's transpiled and you end up with this bundle package. So you literally get no benefit in the browser where you actually could get benefit. Um, so that, that said, you could follow the same pattern even if you do believe in doing that, which is that you should only have one export. And that export, depending, if you want the code to be both node and browser friendly, it should be appended to exports. Or if you just want it to be node friendly, then it should be in this style, which is you do let variable name equals don't export functions. Do not overwrite module.exports with a function. Uh, in short, the reasoning for this is that you're going to at some point make a mistake where you're going to get a circular dependency. And when you do, you want your code not to break. You're shaking your head? No, I, I, I've experienced circular dependencies before. I've been in like many places where I, I actually have a graph where it's like this and this and it grows and it's horrible. Yeah. It's a nightmare. Yeah. So if you if you follow this pattern, you will not have a circular dependency problem. You may have circular dependencies. That is indicative that there is something in your code that probably is not as clean as it could have been or wasn't thought out enough in advance. Code changes, whatever. But at some point, you're going to need a little dirty hack to say, oh, I'm just going to pull this in. And this right here will keep you from having circular dependency problems. Do not overwrite module.exports. Because module.exports lives for the lifetime of your module. So if you overwrite it, then in the case of a circular dependency, you do not have a guaranteed state as to what the other things that are requiring it will receive or won't receive. So that's number one. Oh, and yeah, so we talked about that. Module, module.exports. Okay. Yeah, talked about that. Don't do it. Don't overwrite. You'll, you'll feel better. Okay. So now here's a function that we're exporting. And I actually was just converted to this particular style recently of... Well, kind of, sort of. I'm more, I'm more converted to it now after uh, having hear, hearing somebody discuss this. When I'm in the file, do I want to see, oh, here's the place where are all the exports? Or when I'm modifying a function, do I want to see what is this function exported as? And I, I'm going to agree with the camp that says we should do our exports like this, because when we are in the function, it is clear to us that we have exported it and what it belongs to. 
And in, if we want to see a list of all the exports in a file, that's actually really simple, either by doing code folding in your editor or just by running rip, rip grep, or grep with the name of the module and the dot. And then you will see a straight line of everything that's exported. So I think that you get an advantage that you wouldn't get otherwise by following this pattern. Now, this function, parse emails, is a real function that really works. I've used something just like this for doing some scraping before. Uh, I, I created it on the fly for the presentation, so it's probably not 100% correct, but that's okay, that's not the point. The point is that it is a useful function rather than just your hello world function, and it actually does something that if you run this code locally, it will uh, actually work. So we've got a regular expression. Um, for loops, uh, people, th this is something I hear from newbies, they say, oh, uh, when do I need to use a while, and when do I need to use a do while, and when do I need to use a loop, and when do I need to use a for, and when do I need to use a for? You know what? Forget it all. If you don't know how to do it with for, then you need to focus on for, because for is the only loop you ever need. Every other loop is just syntax sugar for for. Now, that said, I do prefer the dot uh, for each and dot map for using JavaScript arrays and such, but... If you actually need a loop, which in this case we need a loop, we're not, iter we're not using an iterable, we need a loop, always use for. Uh, if you do not supply the initializer, the check, and the, I forget what the third parameter is called. It's not a parameter, it's not even called parameter. Hmm? Increments, the incrementer. But it's not called an incrementer, it's yeah. called something else. It has a name and I forget what it is. But you've got the initializer, the, 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 the condition, and then the other thing. If you just omit them and put semicolons, ba -da -da -da, you have a true loop. Um, so this, what this will do is it'll take some text and it'll run a loop. Uh, little known, you know, this is kind of a more intermediate toward, towards advanced thing, so I'm just going to explain it just for the sake of it, but don't feel like you need to know this. In JavaScript, regular expressions actually keep the state of the text that they operate on, which will bite you in the butt. So in general, don't ever use exec. But there are certain cases in which exec is the right thing to use, and this is one of them. Because what I'm going to do is go over text, and it's going to return a single match. And then as long as I run exec over and over again, it will keep the state of the text that it was running on and will return the match at the next position by keeping track of its internal index. Where this bites you in the butt is if you call exec on two different strings, then you will get unpredictable results because the prior exec will have some sort of internal counter as to where its uh, needle was in the haystack. But, so this will just loop through and it will grab emails and add them into an object and then return the keys of that object. So, a useful function. So here, yeah, we talked about a regex, the, the, the exec for, and then object.keys. Uh, I see people do lots of really weird things with objects to get their keys. There is objects.keys. Just know that that's there. It's there for you. It is your friend. So, there's that. Um, oh gosh, so many bots. They want to learn code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> oh, buddy. Sister19 lol dot girls. <laughs> Once those bots learn node, they're going to take that sister all over the place. And she can go there because she's 19. All right. So this would be some sample input that we'd have for this function. And then here is a unit test. So we're going to break this down. Because this is scary looking, uh, but, but here is a self-contained unit test. I typically write unit tests in this fashion in small files. Uh, then when it gets bigger, I break it out into another file. Um, and there is a, there's two unit test frameworks, or one's a unit test framework, the other one's an integration test framework that I, I can actually recommend. One's called Bear Test, and the other one is called Zora. And they're pretty much way better than anything else that's out there. And it lets you to be really simple, very few dependencies. That means your supply chain security is better. But anyway, that's not the subject I was going for here. So this is just very, very simple stuff. So Node has a built-in assert module. So if you want to test something, you can do an assert. Uh, also, this right here, require.main equals uh, module. This just means that this code block will only run if I'm directly running this file. So if the file is required, it does not run. But if I execute node and then the file name directly, this block of code will run. So for, for small, simple stuff, 
I literally just put my unit tests at the end of the file, and then when I want to run the unit tests or the example, then I just run the file, and then I you know get out this. So we've got here our example text, except I had to shorten it just a touch so that this would fit in one frame, and then this is what I expect to get out of it. Oh, except that this is wrong now because I updated this, but I didn't update this. But we'll just say that it's uh, like that. So you know, here's my expected output. Here's my input. Let me call my parse emails. And then I can assert dot equal expected and emails. And if the strings are the same, then I pass. Otherwise, it'll throw an error. So I don't have to worry about logging anything because it'll just throw the error. And the error will be thrown with what was uh, wrong. So uh, this is just a little known thing that you actually can be very small and very simple and very effective because Node has built in a built-in way to run something automatically in a file conditionally and to give you asserts. So, okay, most of that's not, you know, the particulars aren't, aren't that important, but the overarching idea. So we've got require, require.main, and assert. Those are the things that we're dealing with there. And again, require.main is a very special object uh, because it tells you things about where Node started. So this is also useful in some more advanced use cases that I won't go about, but basically being able to determine where your module is relative to where Node is running. Uh, you can find that out with some of these require variables that exist on, on the require function object. Anyway, any questions about that? Okay. So now we've got this thing. It, we're exporting a function. It's a useful function. We've got a test for it. How do we use it in multiple files? Well, uh, let's say that we wanted to create a parse emails uh, CLI tool. Then we would just do our little require here. And then my require, the name is the same as what I put it internally. I like to keep the names consistent when I can. Um, we could have our this shebang. If you want to make CLI tools in Node, you put a shebang. It's user bin E and V. This is really important because user bin E and V will pull the correct node that you're actually using currently as opposed to a system version of node. Uh, you'll see examples where it's not done this way. The, the way you can tell it's done the right way is that it, this is always the same no matter what, and there's a space there. But there, you'll see other examples where they give the exact path to node, such as user local bin node or user bin node or something like that. But the problem is then that script won't work if you try to copy it over to some other system where node is not in that location or the wrong version of node is in that location or you have a system version of node and you also have a version of node that you're dealing with. You want your stuff to run in the version of node that you're currently using. So that's what the user bin E and V says. Look in the E and B, the, the environment, examine the currently running environment and try to find the, the best node that the user probably wanted. So we've got the require there, and then you know we're just doing some stuff, and we're going to print this out. And then, uh, you know, as a node dev, it's important to know a little tiny bit about links and um, ownership. So I'm not going to go into all of it just to introduce you to it, that it's there and it's something you can look up. But if you want a node program to be executable without running node the thing, if you just want to be able to like what you're doing, serve, you just type serve and hit enter. You need to make it executable. You can get rid of the JS from the name. The JS is not important because this shebang up top will tell the operating system. When I open this file, how should I open this file? I should open this file with node. So you can get rid of the .js, uh, and that's what I'm doing here, is when I'm editing the file, I want all the JS syntax highlighting. Some editors recognize the shebang, and some editors don't, but all editors recognize the file name. So I will create my chmod, uh, I mean, I will chmod the file, meaning change the mode is actually, I guess, what it stands for, meaning is it executable or not. So you can chmod A plus X, meaning anybody can execute this, meaning if it is in a path that the system recognizes, it will be usable as a command. You just said the camera's out of focus. Oh. Hey. Hey. Focus on me. Eyes on me. Hmm, that's weird. That's uh, the bots. That's the bots. <laughs> <laughs> it is the bots. They're hacking into your. They hacked the mainframe. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We got we got focus now. Yeah, sometimes camera just does crazy things. And then ln is link, 
Windows has something similar, but you can only do directories on Windows. So on Windows, the way to do this process is actually to create a, I don't remember if it needs to be a .cmd file or a .bat file, but it needs to be one of those. It should not be a .ps1 file. That's what it should not be. But uh, either, I, I don't remember the difference between .cmd and .bat, bat and command files, but they are subtly different. I think bat is what you want. But you basically just make a bat file in the path, and then Windows requires the extension to be there. But it will, it will run the bat file, and then you can basically just have in the bat file to run the other file. So you have one file that runs another as opposed to linking it. When you create a link in Linux, Unix, Unix meaning uh, Nintendo, Apple, uh, uh, your router, everything, your thermostat, your watch, everything except for, if it doesn't say Windows CE on it, then it's running Unix or Linux. Um, but the, the, what, this link basically just says, hey, I'm going to create a file, but ignore the fact that this is a file. It's actually not really a file. It's a link to this other file. And so if you type the name of the link, so you can keep your, your main file be named .js, but then the system will treat the link the same as that file, except that it has a different name. Um, I probably said that terribly, but either you get it or you don't, but at least you know what to look up. Okay, so with that, now I have a parse email command that is requiring my parse email library, my messenger library, and I'd probably add some sort of send email or something command too. So I could just, I just take a PDF and then say send email. Your paper was great, guys. And then everybody that is listed as an author in the paper will just you know, get an email letting them know that it was great. So yeah, we, we could have our, our parse emails command there. Okay, so, and we talked about this. Oh, and except that uh, I put a space there, that space not supposed to be there, that's a typo, I should fix that. Hey Josh, will you remind me to fix that? Um, Josh edits the videos now. So, everybody say hi Josh. Hi Josh. Hi, Josh. Yeah, <laughs> they'll see that for sure. His name's in there like six times. Okay. Um, so anyway, we've got, uh, yeah, we talked about each of these things already, but I just wanted to isolate them so yeah, you can see. All right, now we've got this thing. We can use it in multiple files. It's awesome. Uh, I mean, it really is a cool tool. You know, I bet you would use this if you had this parse email command. Seriously, how many times you got a PDF or something and you just... Like, well, actually, I guess we'd have to convert it to text first, so we'd need to run PDF to text and then grab it, but all the same. Okay, so how do we share with the others? That's NPM. Oh, this is way too big for an NPM module. Looks <laughs> <laughs> like a left hand joke. Yeah. It was not lost on me. Okay, good. So, um, for years, I had the most popular guide on how to get started with NPM. Uh, I think something else has taken the number one spot. I think it's still on the first page. So if you search how to get started with NPM, you should end up at the same document. But this is basically what you want to do, except that I don't recommend that you set your initial version to 1.0. I recommend you set it to 0 0.1. Uh, reason for that just being that uh, it gives you a little bit of wiggle room before you hit the one, the big, the big 1.0. Although technically, if you're publishing it to NPM and other people are using it, you should... You should do 1.0, but the, the first time you're publishing something, you're probably publishing it more as a beta among colleagues, which I guess you could just use the tag feature for, which is referenced in this document, but then it's more work. So, yeah, tomato, potato. But the thing is, don't be afraid of numbers. There's a lot of them. I will buy you, you and your whole family dinner if you run out of version numbers on your NPM module. You know, if, you, if you find that you hit the limit, you went too high, I'll buy you dinner. Um, so, yeah, you want your, your name, your email, your URL, your version, the license. I would say just put C license and license. The, I, I, the ISC license that's the default for uh, NPM is, as far as open source goes, it's a pretty decent license. It's, I think it's slightly better than MIT in terms of its wording. Uh, I prefer MPL, uh, MPL-2.0. The reason for that is that it gives you, if you do open source work, and you are at all, anything of yours ever actually contributes value to the world, at some point someone's going to try to steal it from you and you're going to think, oh, well, I didn't care because this was just open source. It doesn't feel good when somebody steals something from you. And it's nice to know that you have a legal ownership to it, that you own that name of that thing and that you deserve attribution 
that uh, someone should say, yes, this was written by so-and-so. And the MPL-2 is just gives you a little bit more legal protection in the case that you ever find a business use case for your utility. Um, then, because most of the other, most of the open source licenses are like do whatever the heck you want, which it turns out sounds cool until you actually find a use case for your code and it is of some benefit to you. Which hopefully, if you're releasing code, it actually is something that will benefit you at some point. So I say see license and license because then I don't have to change the license in ten places. And I think that uh, well, it is perfectly valid to upload a code to npm that is not. Uh, 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 open source initiative certified open source you can have visible source code that you allow people to look at it but you retain your rights of either your artistic rights or your copyright uh, obviously you have to grant your copyright to NPM to be able to publish the code but you know anyway I won't go into that any further and then NPM add user which is how you get yourself an NPM user so that you can publish and if we went to this which maybe we will um, I will just show you so that you can see that it's there. Um, nope, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this one. Oh, uh, let's try again. Why is it loading? I don't want to load the PNG. I want to open this in a new tab. Okay, what? The letter L? Oh, oops. I, I must have pasted the PNG link as the... Um, so we can see the text is correct, but behind the text it was linking to the wrong thing. Anyway... So this, basically what you do is you run your npm init, and then if you've done all this other stuff, you can actually just run npm init-y, because then it, instead of asking you and hitting enter, it'll just fill it all out with what you've already set in your file. Uh, and then you use npm version to give a, a version to your thing, and then you do npm publish access equals public. You can use a beta tag. And then I recommend that you name your package, when you name your package, that you name it with your username, so at your username slash package name, uh, because I think that's cooler, it's got better branding, lets people know who you are, and uh, the namespace is kind of polluted, so whatever name you want to use, instead of coming up with some stupid name, you can actually have the name that you want just by prefixing it with your username. So I think that's good, and personally, when I look at dependencies and I see, oh, okay, this has five dependencies or 10 dependencies, but they're from two organizations or from two people, to me that's a good signal because it's like, ah, well, you know, this person's curating what they do. This is probably good quality code. So it could give some, some people like myself a false sense of security that you know what you're doing. Um, okay, so I'll put that in there. Yeah, so we talked about all this stuff. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so now, now that we've published it and we made it so that other people can use it and it's available on NPM and we can require it and we can do all these things, the last thing is to sassify it. And, um, yeah, I'm just going to leave that there because we will, we'll, we'll cover that in the, in the next prison or the next, the next meetup because this has already grown long. But uh, just to go through some slides real quick, this is what uh, a node server can look like. And you can, an app is any function that has a rec and res. Some people think that, that app is something that's specific to Express, which would be reasonable to assume because all the documentation that you encounter doesn't show you that you're actually just using Node and that Express, all Express is doing is basically just an array that's a waterfall handler that says, does this string match? Okay, execute this function or not. And then it also does give a function that brings it back into that loop. That's the next function. So the third parameter that you get with Express is just the function that will bring it back into that loop to continue down the, the waterfall chain in case you can't handle. But uh, a node function can be this simple. I will point out something, again, something that a lot of people don't get uh, right at first, because even the node docs have not been updated uh, properly. You should only ever use the on readable event except for sometimes when you shouldn't. Don't ever use the on data event, except for if you know why you should, uh, because most of the time you shouldn't. There's a couple of edge cases where you had, I, I came into an edge case where I had to use it the other day, but it was because reasons. Um, on readable, on data will guarantee that you get memory leaks in your code, and you don't want memory leaks on your server. It will guarantee it, because the only way that you cannot get 
a memory leak when you're using on data is if your input pipe and your output pipe are exactly the same bandwidth and have no latency. If that condition is not met, which is certainly not the case if you are working with uh, mobile phones that you're delivering content to, then what will happen is it will continue to pump data into memory and create buffers and it'll just keep pumping it and keep pumping it and keep pumping it until memory runs out or until the client consumes it. And so when you have a 50 megabyte file, that's not such a big deal because the person on the mobile phone will get it eventually and you only have one user because you've got some stupid app that nobody cares about and that's the only user you got. But as soon as you have five users, now all of a sudden your app's crashing every five minutes and that's why. It's because you used on data. So uh, usually pipe or readable. If you need to process things one chunk at a time, you want readable. If you want to send things to a client directly, you use pipe. But we'll um, do that again. I'm just going to skip over this stuff. NPM run start. If you if you call your file server.js, then NPM run start will start it automatically, which is just a nice convention to follow. Uh, bonus round. I don't remember what this was about. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're not going to do this. We'll do this next time. So basically, I have a tool that if you want to be able to have other people access what you're working on locally, you can do it. There's also another tool like this called ngrok. This is the one I made. It's written in Node. I rewrote it in Go, but I haven't deployed the Go version yet, so it's still written in Node. I, um, and then Caddy, we'll cover this next time in the, the presentation on how to deploy. So we'll, we'll cover those things. And then I want to leave you with this thought. And I don't know why Daryl Spencer is here twice, but I have a suspicion it's because of hitting write, hitting save twice too quickly and the file actually saving twice. And getting the but... If you use all of your intelligence to build the most complex thing you can, given that there's a defect in there, by definition, it's more complex than you can understand. So, uh, that is, I, I don't know if that, that's even relevant anymore at this point in the presentation, but it is a thought that I'd like to leave you with. All right, so any other questions? What were the testing uh, tools? Yeah, bear test. Supposedly, I don't know if this is true, it claims on the repo that it is actually a node foundation module. It's about 20 lines long, and it's exactly what I would write myself if I were writing a unit testing framework. All it does is give you a function called test that takes a string and then puts that string into an array for you with your function and then loops over the array, and then when it throws an exception, prints out the string that you gave it which is literally what I do when my test gets slightly too long for the putting it in a single file. And then Zora is the other one. Zora is more integration testing, so it has the ability to group tests together and to do subgroupings of tests um, and that sort of thing. So the benefit of these is that they don't have eight years of baggage with them, so when you install them... So I optimize for fewer dependencies, that's usually an indicator to me of code quality because if somebody doesn't have a thousand dependencies, it means that they actually thought about what they were doing before they did it and decided what they needed to do it um, rather than just copying and pasting from Stack Overflow and getting as many things that do a single task as possible. So it's not that Jest and Mocha are necessarily that they lack good engineers behind them but they are also trying to be compatible with Node all the way back to point two or whatever, right? So, and there are too many users requesting too many features, so there's just a lot of bloat you don't need, and it's become popular to start rewriting your code in TypeScript for no good reason whatsoever other than, well, I'm getting paid and I don't have a task today, so I guess I'll rewrite this in TypeScript so that my money gets put to, or the, my employer's money gets put to good use or something. And so then you have to have all the babble and all the compilers and you know, all that stuff. And so your build tool and build tooling ends up being 80% how to transpile code that already worked now from a language that doesn't actually exist or have a compiler into a language that you already were working with. And I think that that's nonsense. If you've got a language that works, why upgrade to a language that literally doesn't work and doesn't exist? But yeah, these are questions of our times that I can't answer. It does God exist? 
<laughs> Who is my savior? Where do I go after I die? Why do people rewrite type things in TypeScript? <laughs> All right, well, at this point, um, since I am uh, the semi-hosting, there's a lot of value in types because it prevents lots of bugs. I, d I agree entirely. I just think TypeScript is entirely the wrong approach, and that if, if we took the approach that's more native to JavaScript, it would, it would be more like GoScript and less like c -sharp script. But I completely agree. There's a wonderful uh, value in types, and that's why I suggest using the TypeScript uh, a linter and the type checking. I think that's absolutely wonderful. But you know what? There's not a lot of value in classes, hierarchies, and interfaces. There's no value in those. But it's called TypeScript. Clearly, it just adds types. Oh, oh yes, of course, of course, <laughs> because it's not an entirely separate language. It's just JavaScript with types. Not an entirely separate language designed by the designer of C Sharp. I mean, I've never written it, but I'm, I'm just assuming based on. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Seems like what I expect. Anyway, since I'm the one presenting, uh, you, you, I can't ask people to uh, clap for me or whatever on my own. That's inappropriate. Oh, yeah, yeah, we should, we should clap for him. <laughs> yeah, it's just something smells wrong. That's a, that's a fair point. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, with that said, uh, most important question that we need to get answered today is... Who is hiring and who is uh, looking for new and fresh opportunities? Me, on the ladder. Fresh opportunities, fresh yeah. opportunities. Yeah. Okay. Here. Fresh opportunities. And what, what was your name? Cece. Cece, okay. I, every, we, when we do around names, I, I don't remember names. Yeah. I don't remember most things. A bunch of stuff, not a whole lot of JavaScript necessarily, but um, Go and Python and a little bit of rust occasionally. Probably some other stuff too. So, let me go back to uh, 84 slides prior. Let's stop there again for a second. <laughs> when there's great options out there, yeah. why would you want Node? No, I, I do love Node. I don't love the way that the community has taken it. But I do, I do really think JavaScript is a great language and that it's got a lot of unique benefits. And I wish that we, as a community, I wish that we were a community and that we had some leaders and that those leaders spoke to the benefits of JavaScript and extolled its virtues rather than tore it down and said, this is worthless. We need to build something different. So anyway, yeah. Um, so I guess now we, we should we just uh, break and I'll turn off the camera. Is anybody on the stream got anything else they want to, a question they want to add or anything? Did the back of my head look good? Was that, was that good today? Because I realized in retrospect, since I'm the one that's got the camera here, blah, 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 blah. But uh, yeah, if anybody else got something to add. Thanks, it was fun. You are welcome, Kurglo. All right, y'all have a good night. I think I'm going to end the stream here in just a second, and we're going to, you know, talk inappropriate things that can't be said on camera. I'll make my joke that I censored myself from earlier in the stream. All right, I don't see anything else. All right, adios, y'all, on the, on the onlines. We're going to be our own people now. If you want to be our own people, too, you got to come here to be with us. Uh, yeah, I was just looking <laughs> <laughs> it's not just a feeling, Kirglo. It's not just a feeling. Looking at it, somebody recommended it here a few months ago. Oh, whoops. Did I have it?